Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 5.48 p.m. And we'll begin our program on ice cores at the top of the hour at 6 p.m. in about 12 minutes from now. As always, if you're watching this in replay form, go ahead and fast forward 12 minutes. You're not going to hurt my feelings. We start early to check in with folks, etc. So hello, folks. How are we this evening? You can hear the birds, the robin singing. That's good. Excellent. Looks like we're off to a good start. Let me grab my drink here real quick and I'll be right back. So how's everybody doing tonight? We have a significant, oh, you heard the muffler guy? Yeah. Oh, muffler boy. Uh, the breeze is quite strong this evening. I'd say 20, 25 mile an hour pretty regularly, steadily. So I guess there's a chance we'll have a, a little bit of buffering issue, but for now, I think we might be doing okay. And uh, I think I figured out the shelter for the phone well enough that we're not absolutely hammered by the wind, audio-wise. Five by five, good. So we'll, uh, it's fun to, to see the sun change position each day. You know, we started these back in mid-March. Sun was way over there at this hour. And uh, I don't know, that always excites me. I don't know why. Uh, we're still doing okay. Dead calm in Prosser. Makes sense. It's supposed to be dead calm tomorrow. We're supposed to get very, very warm. High 80s, early, uh, low 90s uh, later this week. That's our first real dose of hot weather here in eastern Washington. Speaking of which, let's look at the rest of the week, schedule-wise. We revealed the schedule on Sunday morning. That was our last live stream Sunday morning. And I've post, I typically post the week's schedule on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And that's about the extent of my reach. So if you haven't seen this yet, here's the plan. Tonight we're talking about ice cores. All these are Pacific time zones, uh, times in the Pacific time zone, 6 p.m. Uh, Frenchman Cooley is the topic tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Saddle Mountains, 6 p.m. Thursday. So we do three nights in a row, 6 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday every week. And then we don't live stream on Fridays, but Saturday morning, 9 a.m., both Saturday and Sunday. Got some things up my sleeve there. Got a general idea about Sunday. Saturday, I, it's one of those I need to start from scratch. Uh, veterans of the scene here know that these live streams kind of have various styles. Some of them I've done in my sleep and I can just literally wake up and turn the phone on and start talking and it's no problem. 
Others are things I've always meant to learn but never have, and so this is a chance for me to learn new stuff. So I've always meant to learn about George Otis Smith, so I'm personally looking forward to learning what I can. I've got little scraps here and there in my mind. He's a geologist from more than 100 years ago, so I'm lo really looking forward to putting that one together. And then I guess the other, the other category of live streams are uh, things I've been afraid to do. And tonight qualifies, since we're talking about climate again, but I'll, I'll save it till the top of the hour. So good, I'm glad we're working okay. Visually, we're doing okay. We don't need the whole board, I don't think. You can see our friend, the little spinning globe. We can't do a live stream without the spinning globe. Got a couple white, I got at least one white board we're gonna use. So, who we got here? Uh, Terry from Yakima, great to see you. Evelyn, hello. Denmark, 2.53 a.m., you are a trooper. New Zealand, Rob, hello. Southern Alberta, great to see you. Brenda, Jack and Ryan, the teenagers. Jennifer's in Boise. Grandpa Carl in Granger. Oscar in San Diego. Blur, 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 went too fast. Petaluma, California. Helen in Lindwood from the back deck. C. Fritz in Boise, Idaho. A lot of North Americans here. Big Dale, still alive, I see. Livermore, California, New Mexico. Tyler from the old country there in Ohio. Jamie Earl Blue and Heather in Boulder. This sun's getting me right between the eyes, man. Right between the eyes, you gotta love it. Jim from Prineville. Uh, Georgia, Brisbane. Kathy's in Brisbane. Another uh, Australian uh, Joni is with us. Moto Mining from Vancouver Island. You gotta love it. Mark is driving his truck and listening. Uh, we've got our Japanese friend Blue Forest Roads from Tohoku. I wouldn't even know Tohoku except for that terrible tragedy you guys had 10 years ago. Um, Ontario, Canada, hello. Always fun, always fun. JBLM, JBLM. Is that the Army base? JBLM. Can't do it. Georgia, land of the gold. Pequa, Ohio, I remember that place. Charleston, South Carolina again. So yes, if you are a European, you are above and beyond your pay grade here this evening, tuning us in at middle of the night. Um, that's why we do the weekend live streams at uh, uh, 9 a.m. It's always fun to get a few extra exotic viewers, if you want to call them that. I notice we're starting to get some folks from Brazil. Um, that popped in my mind. I kind of forget. Were there a couple other Eastern European countries on the weekends? That was fun. Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, Lewis McCord, such and such. Thank you. I should have known that. You're in the Cozy Fort in Washington, D.C. Is that what they're calling it these days? Hello, Patrick, age six. Patrick with a new puppy. Patrick with two new puppies. All right. Got about 500 folks watching right now. We'll have a few more streaming in here, no pun intended. I think I will collect my thoughts, if you don't mind. Need to concentrate here. And we will begin in three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Ice cores. You gotta love it.
Did you see the email about the fall quarter? No. Um, there's a message that came from Godino right at the end of the day today that it's going to go September 9th to November 24th. September 9th. Uh-huh. Pushing it up. Yeah, it's going to start early to try to beat the flu season. And then it'll also avoid the, but it, I mean, the thing that makes sense about it too is it'll avoid everyone going home for Thanksgiving. And oh my all gosh. Mixing. Wow. That's interesting. It is. Okay. <laughs> the hits keep coming, you know. They, they keep, just when you think you know what's going on. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, uh, pleasant good evening to you all. Thank you for joining us so much uh, this evening. This is my backyard. My name is Nick. I teach at the college here in town. And um, tonight we're talking about ice cores. And I'd like to set the stage for our discussion by reminding ourselves of where we've been to this point with a bunch of these live streams. I've mentioned to many of you that I teach regularly at the 100 level and I've been kind of chicken about teaching science because I know that there's uh, lots of different perspectives, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different very strong opinions, even 19 year olds. And so I've kind of avoided the topic for the most part, but as many of you know, if you've been a regular with us, we have been in my own kind of former farmer worker kind of a way, just kind of plodding along and trying to learn a few new things as they go. So let's look at what we've done in past live streams to try to remind ourselves of a few basic things and then we'll get into this ice core discussion with you. And you heard me chatting with somebody. I have a special guest sitting more than six feet away in the grass and we will trade places here in just a bit. So she will be, uh, standing where I'm standing and talking to you, and uh, you'll be asking an expert on ice cores uh, the questions that you have. So my job, like I did with Walter Zaliga and Bree McGinnis, if you remember those guest spots, my job is just to try to set the table as efficiently as possible. So let's do that. So here are the four, no, those are three. Oh, see now, dig, that, that oak tree is gonna bother me. You know, you know me well enough now. That damn oak tree, I love that oak tree, but it's flip-flopping in the sun. Okay, I, I, I'm past it now. By the time Susan gets here, that, well, the sun will be just perfect. Okay, great. So we had a live stream about Ice Age climate, and I was looking at deep sea sediment. So you can see the board here, right? We have an ocean, we have a bunch of sediment layers in the deepest part of the ocean floors, down there in the dark. And those have been carefully drilled, cored, sampled, and we were looking at oxygen isotope values in each of those deep sea sediment cores. And the whole live stream called Ice Age Climate was simply looking at that, looking at deep sea sediment in the last 2.6 million years and looking for evidence of a lot of ice, not so much ice, glacials, interglacials. Remember, we had dozens of those from studying the deep sea sediment. And that stood alone, and I didn't talk about the future. I didn't talk much. I just focused on that deep sea sediment and left it alone. And that's something I've taught for years and years and years. So that was easy for me to do. I think the, was it the next day? I kind of forget, but we, we then did a live stream on 
what I titled Volcanoes and Climate, and I warned you up front that was a new one for me. I had heard a couple talks by Peter L. Ward and wrote a couple, read, read a couple papers as well, and there are others that talk about the uh, profound effects of volcanism through geologic time. Of course, not in the last century. I'm just talking about through geologic time, tens and tens of millions of years of geologic time. And Peter's main message, and we just explored the idea, you know, I was learning it with you, his main message was, if we have these large igneous provinces, these incredible volumes of basalt that are belched onto the surface in Siberia, in India, in Silesia, in uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, around the time the Pangaea is breaking apart, even our own Columbia River basalts in eastern Washington, when you do a lot of effusive basaltic eruptions, there's evidence that there's incredible amounts of degassing. There's a lot of gases pumped into the atmosphere. And Peter L. Ward and a few others are saying that has a profound warming effect on global climate. Again, we're over millions, tens of millions of years. And the opposite effect is having an explosive volcanic event. On a small scale, Mount St. Helens, 1980. On a small scale, Krakatoa, 1883. But on bigger scales, when we have super volcanic events, where we have thousands of times the volume of material belched into the air, it appears that has some sort of cooling effect. So we just focused on that, looked at the merits of applying that to the geologic record with global climate change, and again, just tried to leave it alone. The most recent of the live streams that we tried was talking about a fellow by the name of Milankovitch. And I've mentioned, like, uh, like almost in passing in some of my 101 classes, if the student says, well, why do we have these crazy back and forth warming and coolings in the last 2.6 million years? I say, well, there's something called the Milankovitch cycle. And it has to do with the uh, elliptical nature of Earth orbit around the sun and a, a cycle of the tilt of the Earth changing and the wobble of the Earth. And if you work with all those factors, you can put that together. And that's about the end of what I say, because I didn't know much more. But with this live stream that we did, whatever that was, a week or two ago, I tried to dig in as quickly or as, as carefully as I could to the Milankovitch cycle. And re I'm reminding you now of what we talked about. It wasn't just this from a Geology 101 textbook, which is talking about uh, cycles of 100,000 years for eccentricity cycles of 41,000 years for obliquity, that's the wobble, uh, uh, that's the tilt, excuse me, the wobbles precession, 26,000 years. It wasn't just that, but one of my main messages from that Milankovitch meeting, let me fumble through my pages because I've got them all under a rock in the grass, and I did not know this, and I think it sets the table nicely for today, is that Malutin Milankovitch did his work, did his incredible mathematics over the course of decades to calculate that there is an astronomical explanation for these cooling and warming times. And when we get to these squiggles that are now quite common in even ice core drilling sites, like I went to today, just trying to, to prepare for Susan's visit, and you have squiggles like this, Malutin, between 1912 and 1941 is mathematically coming up with these kinds of patterns. Decades before we're drilling into the deep sea sediment, decades before we're drilling into the ice and getting cores of ice, ice cores, the topic of tonight. So to me, that's a major message that was unknown to me earlier, that Milankovitch was decades before this drilling, and this drilling, and this drilling, and this drilling pretty much agree, and these two sets of cores pretty much agree with major cycles that Milankovitch had decades before. To me, that's profound, and we leave it at profound. Now, can I get you ready for our visit with Susan? I hope so. Uh, let me remind you of a couple things we were looking at. In the Milankovitch uh, talk, we had something that looked like this. 
Got a shadow there. What is that shadow? What is that shadow? I'm not quite sure. Oh, is it this? No. What is this? What is that shadow? What the hell? This guy can't figure out where the shadow is coming from. What a maroon. So look at all the things we have plotted here. Do you remember this from our Milankovitch talk? We have oxygen isotope values. We have relative temperature values. We have carbon dioxide values. We have methane values. And we have solar variation tied to the Milankovitch cycle. And squiggles are squiggles. And I know that some of you immediately get off the ship as soon as we start looking at squiggles because you assume it's manufactured data. You assume it's some sort of salesman coming to your home and telling you what should you should be doing. You're already on the defensive. I'm not a salesman. I couldn't, I couldn't sell whatever the phrase is. You've got a phrase. I couldn't sell anything to anybody. I'm as, about of obje as objective as they come. I have no dog in this fight. But I am trying to learn what I can, and I'm using this pandemic experiment to share some of these ideas and develop a little bit of guts and, in live time, getting your reactions to some of these things and seeing what works and what doesn't. Okay? So I got a couple more visuals. I promised 15 minutes. I got four minutes left, according to my watch. And then we'll turn it over to Susan. Well, Susan, if you were some papers, where would you be? Right here. There's no one. Uh, that's the term it is. Stuff falling, you got things crashing, you got audio not working, etc. They're used to about everything. Okay, so to set this up, I really don't like this shadow. I'm moving you. We're moving. Now, remember, last time I moved you, we had streaming problems. But I'm going to try to move you as, as gently as I can. Here you go, baby. Here you go, baby. Here you go, baby. We good? Are you buffering? That's as gentle as I can be. Goo goo ga ga, correct. Okay, great. So, a few images for tonight. We've got ice cores that go two miles into the ice sheets in places. And we go back up to 800,000 years of time. Were you aware we had that depth? Were you aware we had that time record? Here's Doug Clark from Western Washington University taking a photograph of a team taking some ice cores from an alpine glacier. So this is not just continental ice, these are also alpine glaciers. And getting the standard three meter cores. One meter cores, three feet. So the standard length for these cores, so you can handle them, is one meter long three feet long, and we'll eventually go into the cozy fort, I guess that maybe after Susan takes off, uh, to get a few little video clips of people working with ice cores in laboratories. I think that's important to include in our discussion. But just to set her up, here's a look at a, a good looking ice core. And you can obviously see a black band here. So that's some volcanic ash. So in other words, so what? You core into the glacier and you pull a bunch of glacial ice up onto um, the rig. And then you get it to a lab and you saw it and you prep it and then you bring it back to your university. What's, what's the point? Well, the point is you can get down to annual layers within an ice core. And we can ask Susan how common that is, but at least on websites, it's very, very simple. Winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer. You're, it's, it's truly like, do you remember our discussion of varves? Varves are these layers of, of silt and clay in the bottoms of lakes. Dark meant uh, winter, light meant summer. You can count years between Missoula floods, for instance, up in Glacial Lake Columbia, like Brian Atwater did in the sand poil arm. Or what's the common analogy? Tree rings. You can count years in glacial ice cores, just like you can count years when you core a tree. Tree cores, ice cores. There's parallels. 
Did you know that? I guess I didn't quite know it was that, um, that direct. So, again, you can find certain layers. I grabbed this one because apparently this is ash from the Toba eruption, which was a tremendous eruption, and they've got the date based on its position in the ice. The Toba eruption, instead of just saying 74,000 years ago, which I've always said, uh, it's now down to, I'm reading backwards now, 73.88 thousand years ago, plus or minus 0.33 thousand. That's pretty sweet. We can get volcanic time markers, essentially, tephra or ash layer deposits. But wait, there's more. I said I wasn't a salesman, but I, that's a classic salesman move. Wait, there's more. When you start shaving this ice core material down to its thinnest slivers, you can find bubbles of trapped gas. And so depending on where you are in the Antarctic ice sheet, in other words, how far down you are, apparently it's quite bubbly. Well, I'll ask Susan in a second. Quite, apparently it's quite bubbly in the upper part of the, the upper, oh, I'm not even gonna say anything. We'll just go to her. But the point is, if you have beautifully preserved bubbles, you have bubbles trapped in the glacial ice that are little time capsules for the chemistry, the atmospheric chemistry, when that ice was made. And therefore you can melt the ice, you can treat the, you can, you can work with those bubbles and actually directly measure changes in gases that are in present, that, that's in the, in the earth uh, atmosphere past. And so we're back to these squiggles, not from the deep ocean mud, not from Milankovic, doing his math in his uh, dingy little apartment in Serbia. Instead, we're doing this from the ice. And the agreement is profound. Right between the eyes, 15 minutes from the time that I started. Okay, the breeze is picking up, it doesn't bother us. The oak tree's flapping like crazy, but it's not gonna bother us because we're in a good position. I'm gonna check one more time, are we good? with our buffering before I turn it to Susan. And I'm gonna encourage her to stand. I'm gonna get this lower for you, Susan. And I'm hoping you can stand pretty much right here so that they can hear you. And I'll keep my distance. <clears throat> Actually, let me grab my laptop. So this is Susan, Susan Kaspari. She works with me at Central Washington University. Go ahead and say hi to these guys if you will. All right, good evening. <laughs> You're a big sport for helping out. Um, are you okay with about like this? Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, you've been here at Central how long, and have you had any experience on other continents with, with ice cores like we were talking? Okay, yeah, sure. So, I've been here at Central since 2009, and I started working with ice cores back in 2001 at the beginning of graduate school. I worked originally with uh, collecting ice cores in Antarctica, um, did traverses for two years around West Antarctica collecting ice cores. And then uh, for my uh, PhD, I switched to working in the Himalayas and collected ice cores mostly in the Tibetan Plateau, but also did some work in the Pamirs in Tajikistan and in New Zealand. Um, and I've done a little bit of work in the Alps. Um, and then since I arrived here in 2009, um, I've done, I've worked on cores continuously from all over the world, um, but a lot of my field work is focused more so um, locally here in the Cascades. And I've worked with cores from South Cascade Glacier up in the North Cascades, and we've gotten shallow cores um, off of Mount Olympus. Good. How are we doing with audio, first of all, for her? Is that working okay? Let's just pause for a second. I know you're kind of sweating into the sun. Let's see, what are they doing? Oh, they're talking, they, they like your jacket. So I mean, come on now, let's focus on the science here. Can we please? This is my dress nano. <laughs> I put on the clean one for this. <laughs> Audio's good. Okay, great, we'll proceed. Um, so you did some, your PhD at University of Maine. That mm -hmm. appears to be kind of a hotbed. Can you talk about your training or did you have a mentor? Or is there yeah. still kind of a major... Yeah, so, so there's, season. I mean, there's a few different laboratories in the United States that are, are the heavy hitters. Um, University of Maine is certainly one of them. And so I worked under Paul Majewski, um, who's been doing ice core science for a long time. 
Um, he, uh, his work was more so, look, he, we, I shouldn't say that, he was involved in some of the deep projects in Greenland, um, but under him, a lot of what us were, uh, the work we were doing is looking more so at more recent climates. So my particular interest is um, really looking at the last few hundred years of what we can get out of the ice core records because I'm really interested in the environmental change story. So you came here to central Washington in hopes that you could build some kind of lab, some sort of ice core lab. Were you successful in doing that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, when I came originally, I was supposed to, to get an ice core lab and I was attracted to come to Washington because Washington's a beautiful place and it's got the largest amount of glaciers of anywhere in the lower 48. Um, but for several years there, I had um, chest freezers that I worked out of and um, that was just pretty miserable. And so I would go, um, I'd often go and work in laboratories elsewhere. Um, but since we got our new building, Discovery Hall, a couple years ago, I now have a state-of-the-art ice core facility. Um, I've worked in different facilities around the world and the one that we have here at Central is as good as what you can have anywhere else. Um, and so anyways, when things are better, for those of you that are interested, if you want to come get a tour, I'm always happy to share it with people. And you've always had one or two graduate students doing specific stuff. What's an example of a project or two that you guys have done in the last few years using your new ice core facility? Um, well, most, the most recent intense work that I had there was um, a visiting Brazilian PhD student, Luciana Marchetto. Um, who came and worked for um, six very focused months in the lab, and he was working with ice with um, ice cores from West Antarctica. And then we also um, a lot of what we're doing in there is also just snow research. Um, but the more recent work has been from South Cascade Glacier, so that's located up um, near. Um, if you went due west from Stahican up in the North Cascades, that would get you to South Cascade Glacier, and that's a benchmark glacier that the USGS has been studying, the United States Geological Survey has been studying since the 1950s. Um, and there was a deep core that was drilled there in 1994. And- um, Who drilled that? Um, that was drilled by the United States Geological Survey. And then it sat, um, it basically sat for 20 years at the National Ice Core Laboratory um, in Denver, actually about a mile from where I grew up. Huh. And, um, Nobody, well, the, the USGS's funding had been told to work on it, and then nobody had taken it because generally what you want, what makes a good ice core site is either someplace um, that's a high latitude, so a place like Antarctica or Greenland that's really cold, or someplace that's high elevation, so places like the Himalayas, um, really high mountain elevation <coughs> areas. So <clears throat> the Cascades are not a location that is by any means considered ideal for collecting an ice core, um, but for what I wanted to look at in this particular core, um, it was okay that it was lower elevation and that it was a warmer glacier. And you found some interesting results between the 1940 and 1960? Yes. What was, what was going on back then and what was the signature like in that core? Okay, yes, yeah, so what, what my expertise is in is measuring um, ice cores for black carbon. So black carbon comes from the incomplete combustion of fossil or biofuels. So basically wood burning or forest fires or burning fossil fuels. Um, any kind of incomplete combustion activity will produce black carbon. And then that material gets transported in the atmosphere. And so it's actually um, second only to carbon dioxide and what's causing um, climate to warm right now because it's a, it's a dark particle that absorbs energy from the sun and it causes the atmosphere to heat. And then when it gets deposited on glacier surfaces, it basically darkens the snow. And so the snow, which is normally really white and reflective, and that bright sun like that's shining in my <laughs> eyes right now, um, normally the sun would reflect that right back out, um, right back out to space. And so that's why on a really sunny day when you're on fresh snow, um, you know, you've got to wear sunblock, you need sunglasses. Um, but when you start to put dirty stuff on the snow, it absorbs a lot more energy. And so what my expertise is, and really, what I've really focused on is studying dirty snow and ice. And so I'm interested in, in looking at, at black carbon and dust and different organic matter that can um, darken, our, darken the snow surfaces. And um, the ice cores are really useful for us for two reasons. One, they, we can use them to tell us you know, how much black carbon and dust was in the atmosphere in the past. And then it also is really important because we can look at how much black carbon and dust um, was deposited on a glacier. And that tells us how much um, those materials could be accelerating the melt of the glacier. 
And so that ice core record that um, we just had published um, was showing that that black carbon concentrations during um, the period of about 1940 to 1960 were about 16 times higher than background levels in the pre-industrial era. So that tells us something really important about what was go what's been going on um, both from industrialization and also wildfire activity in this region. Doing great. <laughs> Super awkward. You're talking to a phone and you got somebody else like <laughs> talking over your shoulder. But uh, um, I think we'll go to some, some live questions if you're okay. So I assume you can all hear me. I'm kind of shouting now, but I think we'll turn it over to you guys. Can I just say one Please. more thing? Because there's one thing I had said to Nick um, with Nick's very loyal followers that I thought would be of interest to some of you, yeah. which is that um, dating those cores, uh, dating ice cores is tricky business. You've got to have, there's a lot of work that goes into just dating the cores um, to know at what, you know, at what depth, what age that snow and ice is. And that South Cascade core was a tricky one to date. Um, but something that was, it was really interesting with it, and since Nick was just talking about volcanic activity, is that we were able to use um, an ash layer from the 1980s Mount St. Helens eruption as one, of our, as one of our dating points. And seeing that we're celebrating the anniversary of Mount St. Helens, yeah. and there's a lot of local regional interest. I thought that was a tidbit <laughs> people would like. So. That's nice, right, great. Okay, if you're new to us, we type in the uppercase for your questions, and I'll be able to kind of pick yours. So, Susan, you have no responsibilities except waiting for the man in the uh, grass to ask you a question. <laughs> and uh, we'll try to keep this rolling. You got 10, 15 minutes to do this? Jeff asked, do... All right. Jeff asked, do cores from different regions match up in their time sequences? What kind of match do you have between a core in Greenland and a core in Antarctica as far as keeping track of time, maybe? Yeah, it depends. It depends upon which time scales you're talking about. So there's, <clears throat> um, if you're looking at longer periods of time, like, like glacial cycles, you'll see very similar signals between what, what's observed in Greenland and what's observed in Antarctica. If you start to look at finer time scales, you've got regional differences in what was happening with climate. So um, there's events, things like the Younger Dryas, where you'll see an offset in timing between Antarctica and Greenland because the Earth isn't, everything climatically isn't happening the exact same time every single place. Well, that's what Robbie asked about. Did you find any evidence of cosmic impact near the end of the Younger Dryas? Or generally, can you talk about the Younger Dryas? What is it? And what, what does the evidence look like in the cores that you've seen? Okay. Yeah, so first of all, <clears throat> I'll say I don't work on, I work mu on much more modern cores, so my expertise is really looking at things over the last few hundred years. Um, but the Younger Dryas is basically coming out of the last um, glacial period. It was a short period of time that returned to cooler conditions, um, not, not full glacial conditions but it was a period of time that's observed in many locations around the world that shows a return to cooler time. Okay. Uh, just a follow-up, do you know of any evidence of cosmic impact in an ice core? Like, would you find a layer of iridium or something to prove? No, I don't, I mean, our, our oldest, our oldest, yeah, <laughs> our oldest, um, our oldest cores are, are I mean, the, the detailed records are 800,000 years old. We've got, um, there's some sites that people are working on now that go, that are anticipated to go um, more like a million and a half. Um, but in terms of some of those types of events, that's before the time of, that the ice is preserved. Yeah. Ian, fifth grade from Cooley City, Washington. <laughs> How heavy is an ice core? It de that's a great question. It depends upon um, how dense the snow or ice is. So if we're talking about, what, I, I think Ian, you could easily carry one around. Um, if it's from the surface of the, of the glacier, it's gonna be a lot lighter because it's, um, it's not as dense. Whereas when you get deeper, um, that the ice core will be as, as dense or nearly as dense as the water that you would freeze in your, um, that you would freeze in your freezer. So it's uh, an ice core, I don't know. I, I should know that. Um, 
because I used to weigh them all the time. But, <laughs> um, but they, yeah, we used to weigh them all the time for measuring density, but, but a, a few pounds. Well, at least back in the day before you were with young kids, weren't you up doing a bunch of mountaineering and stuff in Asia, let's say, and, and, and collecting cores and hauling right. them out of there somehow? Yes, yeah, so so getting the cores um, was always a big adventure, so it depends upon where you are. Um, in Antarctica, we were, you know, we were using heavy machinery to help us move our cores around, um, but in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, that was a whole different adventure. Um, there we were reliant uh, mostly on mound power, and then we also would use yaks, so we would drive big trucks across the Tibetan Plateau with our equipment to get as close to glaciers as we could. And then we would usually have an um, overland portion where we were on foot and we would hope we would hire um, local um, nomad nomadic Tibetans that were yak herders and we would use the yaks to move equipment into the base of the glacier. And then um, we used ourselves to be able to, um, to haul the material up higher onto the glacier. Very cool, very cool. Uh, Louise asks, uh, tell us what you're learning from ice about the climate story over the last 200 years. Like, just yeah. recently, what major changes are you seeing with the ice cores you've been working with? <clears throat> well, the ice cores, uh, I mean, as I said, my, my expertise is really in looking, most recently is in looking at um, the black carbon. And so we definitely see a very large increase. Um, all the sites that I've worked on in, in both the Himalayas um, and more locally here in the Cascades, um, those all show that we're seeing a large increase. Um, the timing depends upon the timing of industrialization. So in Europe and in um, sites like Greenland or the Cascades that are recording um, North American and European activities show an earlier increase. And then as people transition to um, cleaner uh, burning technologies that starts to go down but in places that are more recently industrializing and that are still using um, dirtier fuel sources you'll see um, a much more recent increase this is great we'll do a few more if you're willing <laughs> uh, Jeff asked would black carbon also be forest fire soot and if so is that in VARBS um, yes, so that you need to invite you need to invite Megan Walsh to come give one of your talks. Yeah. So um, yes, yeah, so absolutely, uh, wildfire activity is a is a huge um, component of it, and a lot of um, the work that we're doing, my students and I are doing, is not just looking at ice cores, but also looking at the snowpack. So um, some of what we're interested in is looking at. Um, in, the, in the forest environments after they burn, you're left with standing dead trees that we refer to as snags. And those, those trees are just covered in, in char or soot and black carbon. And that material continues to slough off onto the snowpack and that causes the snow to melt much more quickly. So um, the, we have a paper that's um, in press right now and we show up at that Table Mountain fire that burned very close to Ellensburg here, um, that snow melts, uh, was, is melting three weeks sooner than it did historically from that site. Um, Megan Walsh, who is a geographer at, at CWU, um, who, measure, or who uses lake sediment cores, um, she looks at charcoal. And so she has very interesting work um, showing um, more on the scale of, of the last many thousands of years, um, the history of fires in our region. And she's able to show um, very interesting patterns related to um, humans on the landscape. So natives were using, um, were widely uh, burning across the landscape to be able to use the land. And then you also, she's got some very interesting work showing a very clear signal from um, when Europeans came and, and what that did to the natives and their burning. Good. Uh, William, which ice core location has the best ice in Washington and everywhere? Well, Washington, I'd say that there really is not a good place to collect ice cores. Um, yeah, what so are you doing here, <laughs> it's a gorgeous place to yes, live. It is. It's a we're, wonderful place to live. We, and we love that you're here. Yeah, no, there's there's great ice core scientists living in some places in this country that I would not want to live. I'm yeah. thrilled to be here in Washington. Um, it really depends upon what you're wanting to work on. So if you're interested in looking in reconstructing climate over very long time periods, then you, you need to be working in Antarctica or Greenland. 
Um, Antarctica, uh, East Antarctica, where there's very little accumulation, is going to provide the records with the longest, the, our, our longest ice core records that we have. Um, if you, but, but when Nick was talking about that idea of VARVs, um, what you trade off is that you're not getting that really fine um, seasonal, uh, seasonal signal. What you're getting is, is much coarser information, but over much, much longer periods of time. Um, if you want to, for me, after working in Antarctica, I, I did five seasons in Antarctica. The first three were, were just as a worker. I used to fuel airplanes down there for a couple of years, and then I transitioned to being a grad student. Um, but I, I was interested in being closer to what the, where the human story was. So it's not that we can't record um, human signal in Antarctica. We certainly do. Um, but some of the stories I was interested in, I, I wanted to be closer to, to where the human populations were because I'm really interested in the environmental story. Um, but on that note, I do want to say, ah! <laughs> you <got a> cut? <laughs> oh my God. There's a gorilla. <laughs> I'd like to apologize for the gorilla, sorry. <laughs> I guess we'll continue. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so, yeah, what's this? Uh, we'll, what's we'll, the, <laughs> we'll let them do their thing. All Hi, right. Gorilla, thank you. <laughs> is that you, Brogan? Yeah, that's the name I was looking for. I saw the spoofs. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's not in his ball today. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, I, the one thing I want to say is that, that ice cores provide a tremendous wealth of information. So from looking at the last couple hundred years to looking back over many, many glacial cycles, I definitely feel that ice cores provide a broader range of information than you can get out of any other type of climate archive. Um, that said, you need to have climate archives from all locations to yeah. be able to reconstruct what Earth's climate was like because polar or high elevation sites don't tell you what was happening in the oceans, don't tell you what was happening at low latitudes. Um, but for me, um, there's uh, tremendous contributions from ice core science, but the thing that I think is most valuable that we get out of them is what Nick was talking about with those gases. Um, if we didn't have ice cores, we would not know that um, how carbon dioxide concentrations have changed over the last many glacial cycles. And so it's from those little bubbles that are trapped in the ice that we now know that during past interglacial cycles, during the, the warm periods more similar to today, the carbon dioxide was never higher than 280 parts per million by volume. And now we're up, uh, we're getting close to a 410. And we now know over 800,000 years that never happened before. What's happening right now is just truly unprecedented. And it's those little bubbles in the ice that tell us that. We'll look at a, a couple of short little videos in the Cozy Fort. And one of them is a really, I think, a great job of showing uh, what's been measured recently and getting above the 300 threshold, but then going back in geologic time and putting it into perspective to show it's, it's unprecedented. So um, a few more. I, I'm not going to sleep well after seeing that guy out there. Uh, Daniel, age 12, what is the most interesting evidence you have found in an ice core? Hmm. That's, a, that's a tougher one for me to answer because there's a lot of different... There's a lot of different things that we find. Um, I mean, because I've been so focused on the black carbon, for me, it's just fascinating to be able to record, um, to record just these very evident changes of how we've modified the what's in our air. Um, so, and then it's just there's just different things that we're discovering in them all the time. The the um, the methods that we have available to us to look at the ice is constantly changing. Um, so, you know, most recently when we were looking for that Mount St. Helens ash, um, we were looking at that through the scanning electron microscope that we okay. have. And all of a sudden we were looking at these just absolutely beautiful diatoms that were recorded in the ice. And I historically um, was always measuring the chemistry and I'd get those squiggly lines like Nick was showing. And so to see something like these beautiful diatoms that are trapped in the ice, that, that's exciting for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, totally. Um, three more and we're done. These are pretty straightforward. Do you have to handle the cores in a way that you don't contaminate them? Yeah, so decontamination is a, is a huge um, issue with ice cores. So we collect them in the field. Usually we're having to use generators to be able to collect them. Um, we keep our gener generators downwind. But when we, get those, when we get those ice cores back into our labs, we're extremely careful 
Um, a lot of what we're measuring are, are trace elements that are in extremely low concentrations, and so we only measure those from the innermost part of the ice, whereas there's other things like isotopes that we can't contaminate for, so we can use the outer portion of the ice for that. Um, but ice core scientists spend a ton of time decontaminating their ice and making sure um, that the signal they're measuring from the interior of the ice has not been contaminated. Michael says, can you tell the can you differentiate between industrial and natural sources of carbon and how? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting question also. So how do we tell the difference between natural versus industrial? Um, I did some work, I was on sabbatical a few years ago um, back at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland um, and there's scientists there um, that have developed a method where you can take um, the, you can take the carbon and then they do C14 dating on it. And so we did some of that work on some of my samples. And so you can tell the difference that if it's, if it's modern carbon, then that is um, from natural sources, whereas if it's fossil fuel carbon, then it is, it is older than that. There's my family. Hey, come on over. <laughs> come on over, you guys. <coughs> They're not as scary this as This is a good gorilla. way to finish then. Well, good, good. Yeah, let's get those guys on <coughs> camera at least. Come on over, you guys. <laughs> well, we sure do. Come over here. You guys yeah. can be on live. <laughs> These guys are out for their evening walk. And we're just answering one or two more questions. Here, come here, Hyla. Here, come here. I can get you so they can too. So, Jesse, you want to stand next to Sue? Were you involved in the, in the ice core retrieval at some point, maybe in the Himalayas or something like that? Or what's your background in some of this? Uh, I helped out on the trip to Nepal where we did some, a pilot study there doing. Uh, snow samples. I don't know if she's talked about that at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was poor man ice coring. We couldn't get a core up there, so we just dropped into crevasses and measured along, collected snow along the crevasses. Have you guys been up to see your mom's ice core lab? Of course you have. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you guys dropped in. Mom's about done, I think. I got one more, which we can kind of end with, Susan. You've this is a conservative area. You've talked to Rotary and Kiwanis and other groups. And what's the main, is there, how do you handle, you can answer this any way you want. Like, if you have pretty strong opinions against what you're presenting, how do you handle that? What, how, what, what questions I, do you get? How do you, how do you deal with it? I encounter that less and less. I, I think when I started doing this close to 20 years ago, that was something I ran into really? a lot more. Um, I mean, really, the, the data shows that most Americans understand what's happening to our climate and um, what the causes of it are. So the climate skeptics are really increasingly a smaller portion of it. Um, but I do know, I mean, both in my classes and sometimes people in the community, um, you know, the climate Climate has really been politicized in our country. Yeah. Um, and so I'm a scientist and I feel like my role is to, to talk, with, talk with people about the science, but um, for, because sometimes I know there are people that I won't be able to get through to, I think the most important thing to do is just to talk about where you do have shared values. Yes. So there's some things that I think we can all agree on, whether or not you are concerned about black carbon's effect on climate you probably are concerned about someone you love breathing in black carbon and knowing it causes them asthma or, or lung disease. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a matter of for those people that you can't, um, that you can't come, you can't see eye to eye on, on what's happening with our climate, that there's other ways that we can yes. see eye to eye. Good. Love it. Well, All right. I'm sure these guys loved it. I'm sure there's a bunch <laughs> of questions we didn't get to, but um, thanks for coming over, you guys. Did you want, anybody want to tap dance or anything? <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to move on to something else. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Nick. Watch your head, Jesse. I'd hate to have you. Thanks so much for coming over. Thanks, Nick. Really we'll do appreciate you. it. Good luck with you your bet. gorilla. Thank you. Oh, God. It wasn't you, Jesse, was it? Woo! Okay. Uh, you know, let's see.
Um, I want to go, I want to show you a few short videos and hope to keep your attention. It, some of it, it works quite nicely with what Susan was just saying. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, live chat is still happening. Okay, good. Let's, um, yeah, I'm going to move you back over to the house. Give me just a couple minutes to set up the cozy fort and then I think this is worth your time to get some visuals with the cores themselves and the work that's been done. And then we'll do a little bit more live Q&A even though you're not talking to the expert, but maybe I can help a little bit. It's so fun to have neighbors who are smart. And uh, nobody's turned me down yet, you know? I suppose there'll be a time when I ask somebody to come over and they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I heard about what you're doing. I'm not doing that. So, Cozy Fort by Steve. Trademark. Uh, if you had, especially if you're a child and you had an excellent question, I'm sure it was a good one and I'm sorry I didn't get to it. Um, I knew nothing about ice cores, and then after maybe two hours of reading certain things this afternoon, I was amazed at the amount of information that's available very easily. And so if I can find a bunch of info, you can find a bunch of info. But with this topic... Uh, quite often people are suspicious of the data. Oh, good Lord. What is going on? <laughs> it's a good thing Steve numbered these. <laughs> I am a maroon! I honestly couldn't figure out which what the shadow was. <laughs> ah. All right. Most of you are still with us, and I, I think it will be worth your time. Hello. So I got um, three short clips to share with you. So I got um, quiet. Three short quiet. And here's the first. It's two minutes. It's a busy, freezing cold day inside the National Ice Core Lab in Denver, Colorado. We're gonna cut gas samples out of this core. Scientists from Maine to California here to cut pieces of precious Antarctic glacier ice to take back to their labs for study. We started the Ice Core project in 2005. With support from the National Science Foundation for a project called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, or Waste Divide, Lab manager Mark Twickler and a team of scientists, engineers, and support personnel traveled to the bottom of the world to drill out and bring back these ice cores. The goal of the project, to collect and study perfectly preserved records of the distant past. The unique things about polar glaciers is each year that it snows there, the snow never melts. So you get one year of snow on top of the next year of snow. It compresses, so everything that fell out of the atmosphere, dust, salt from the ocean, volcanic ash, is preserved in that ice core. This particular ice sheet is more than 70,000 years old. The team drilled down more than two miles into it to retrieve these cores, which were then flown to the U.S. and stored in a giant 40 below zero freezer here at the ice core lab. Uh, inside this freezer contains more than 10 miles of ice cores collected from around the world. 
Twickler says the ice core's layers are like tree rings, each layer representing a year of weather and snow. We can tell what the, what the temperatures were. We can tell how rough the oceans were around Antarctica. Bubbles. We can tell how dusty Australia was. Scientists are keen to study the bubbles trapped in the cores, each a tiny pocket of air frozen in time. We can measure a variety of gases that were in the atmosphere at the time the bubbles were formed. Other scientists want to know how ice sheets melt over time. We don't necessarily have a really good handle on how the ice sheet as a whole will respond in a case of changing climate. Twickler says good. this icy blast from the past is helping researchers better understand the... To me, that's amazing. I don't know about you. Maybe you know all this stuff already. Here's a gal who um, now teaches in Maine, probably knows Susan. I, don't, I forgot to ask if they know each other. She's doing some interesting work. Those wiggly lines, we can see an annual um, signal, kind of like tree rings. And we can't really see that in this ice, but, um, but as we look at the chemistry that comes out of the ice, we can, we can see that annual record. I'm gonna turn up the pump. So we have a clean lab where we melt the ice core. The ice is melted from one end to the other on a hot plate. You can hear the sound of the, of the core. It's pretty neat as the, um, as the ice melts. And, um, and the water is pulled through that plate, allowing us to get the inside of the ice core without ever um, having the outer part um, contaminate that inner part of the core. For the ice that we're melting today, a single year is about this much ice. And so um, if you imagine the, the stuff we're measuring on a really high resolution, through that year, we can see changes happening and actually figure out what season um, these changes are happening. You can reconstruct the temperature of Earth or the local regional temperature, so Antarctic temperature. Um, you can reconstruct the strength of the winds or the, the strength of the atmospheric circulation around Antarctica. We also see volcanic eruptions, and actually today we'll be uh, melting ice that may show evidence of an ancient volcanic eruption, which would be very exciting. So these are top up arrows. So the top of the core is here, and we melt top to bottom. And that way we can connect all the segments of ice, because they're in one meter segments, and um, create a long record. Minus 20 C. Not that much colder than a typical winter day in Maine, but still cold enough to suit up. I'm uh, prepping the cores to, to melt, so I need to clean the ends of the cores. Um, there might be some dust or particles that are just sort of stuck on the ends. So I scrape those off and uh, get the ice into its core tray. These are um, ceramic blades, so they should not contaminate the chemistry of the core, and we clean them every day. Everything in the ice core world is uh, very sensitive because these are pristine records of ancient atmospheric chemistry, and we have to treat them that way. I mean, I'm, I'm helping Bess track volcanic eruptions in uh, an Antarctic ice core that spans back to 2,300 years. I mean, where else am I going to get experience like that? Two and a half centimeters a minute. So. We actually had a really interesting conversation out in West Antarctica. The fact that we're taking about two miles of ice and slowly drilling it over the course of three years and then melting it all and then analyzing it all. It's such a huge project that you can't really see it all at once. Um, it's like you have to walk the distance of two miles to understand how much ice there is. It's just astonishing to think about what was happening in the world at that time and the fact that this ice records the, the snow that fell at that time in Antarctica. Well. I wouldn't know anything about the world except that world, except for Susan had an office next to mine in the old building. And I think she said it quickly with you guys, but she would have freezers like you have in your garage, you know, chest freezers. And she'd have her, what? she'd have her ice cores in that. And she'd be just improvising left and right. And then a few years ago, we had the good fortune to move into this brand new building. 
and her ice core uh, laboratory is beautiful. And I, as I'm walking down the hall, I peek in there occasionally, and it's just like you saw with those two gals in that lab. And um, she's got students from around the world who are knocking on her door, Susan I'm talking about, trying to get into her program, and she's very selective on who she accepts as a new graduate student. But um, there's just a few places where you can do that detailed work with ice cores, and because of her specialization and because her timing was real good, she was here about five years before we moved into that building, and now she's, she's thriving with that new setup. Uh, and it's great to see. I have one more thing for you. I don't know what your reaction will be to this, but it, I feel it's important to share it with you. And knowing that we have these trapped bubbles, know that we have that process we just saw with the gal in Maine and Susan's descriptions, and the other folks in that ice core lab in Denver, that facility, um, all of that work with ancient gases trapped in these ice layers yields this kind of data. And this is the plot that I'd like to share with you. I think it's beautifully done, and I'll try to narrate the best I understand it. I've only seen it twice, but I think I get the gist of what's talking about we're talking about atmospheric carbon dioxide in parts per million, and they start with 20th century observations at Mauna Loa and the South Pole and also using background conditions. And you can see, I'm just trying to describe what you're about to see, you can see what looks like kind of a natural annual pattern, and you're like, okay, well, it's just a natural thing. And there's a little bit of rise in CO2, but okay, I guess that's just kind of the way the Earth works. And I thought that was the end of the, of the animation, but it wasn't. And then they started going back in time, centuries, and then thousands of years, and then hundreds of thousands of years using the ice core data. And to me, that's what's missing in much of this discussion, for me. So I'll try to just keep you updated on what you're looking at in case it's not obvious to you. You might see some things that it's not obvious to me, but I feel like it, it needs to be included in this discussion. And then we'll uh, talk about the uh, man in the uh, gorilla suit that I don't know if you saw out in the alley, but it scared me. And it scared her, scared Susan too. <laughs> he might still be out there. I don't want to think about that. I'm hiding in the, I don't see him. If it's broken, I'm gonna, Okay, so you see the years in the lower right, 1979 to 1985. The x-axis, sorry, the y-axis is, is uh, parts per million. So if you see in the middle that spinning dial, the year is 1986, 1987. We're plotting January, April, July, October. And the red dot is Mauna Loa observations, those are measurements now, this is data, and this is talking about how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, parts per million. You can see there's a, the plot on the right is showing us this winter-summer, winter-summer pattern. And generally things are rising above 360 parts per million depending on the time of year, depending on the latitude, we have higher than 380 parts per million. Again, to me, that's like, okay, yeah, all right, I guess so. All right, since now we're 1980 to 2000, we're to 2003, 2004. Again, this is, this is not ice core yet. This is just direct observations of changing levels of carbon di dioxide in the atmosphere above 380 parts per million. But at least me, maybe you, looks at this and goes, well, I don't know, maybe it was 380 parts per million 1,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. Maybe this is part of some sort of natural cycle. So if this is all they showed, I don't think I'd be that impressed, even though it's interesting. But we're about to switch gears. And to me, that's the benefit of spending this to you, uh, sh sharing this with you. Here we go. I can't read backwards now. You might have to read for me. What's the green? 
It's, we're back in the 1970s now, the 1960s, looking at carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. I can't read that backwards. Hopefully you can. Now we're going back 100 years, 200 years. Now we're going back centuries. And you can see that those parts per million values that we were looking at to start with are extraordinary compared to, uh oh, now we're going back thousands of years. We're BC, 5,000 BC, 10,000 BC. And now tens of thousands of years. Now we're to the ice core data. The blue, I know without even being able to read it frontwards, is the topic of tonight's discussion. And do we have variability in carbon dioxide levels in those trapped bubbles of gas? Yes, we do. Is there a pattern? Yes, there is. The Milankovitch pattern. The hundreds of thousands of years and the, and the eccentricity and the obliquity and the precession. But we go back 800,000 years and everything is below 300 parts per million. And we're way above that now. And then if your thought is, well, what if you go back a million years or two million years? We've already talked about that. And we can, you can go back to that live stream on volcanoes and climate, or you can, you can look to some other data that's earlier than that. But uh, it's been tens of millions of years since we've been uh, where we are now. And I'm choosing to end our discussion there and not look to the future, but just to look at the data that we have. And to me, just talking about me now, that's what's missing. Objective discussion of data. Can we all agree that's data? Can we all agree that's real? If we can't agree, then okay, I guess we should stop having the conversation. But for me, if we're going layer by layer in glacial ice and we've had more than one working group more than one nationality, more than one decade compiling this data. And we have, you know, this, this started in the 50s. The data is quite strong at this point. Okay, uh, we'll try some live Q&A. If you want to continue to try to ask a few things, you know who you're talking to, not the expert, but I will try to just, just a little bit of this. And then we'll talk about the rest of the week's live streams. It's after seven o'clock. Maybe we'll do five or 10 minutes of this. Mickey's gonna have nightmares tonight. All right, live stream. There we are. Pop out my chat like a boss. Right between the eyes. Uppercase, please, if you would. Let me scroll back, see if we have any remaining questions. Can I give you the link for that last video? Uh, it's all, um, I went to one place to get all that stuff. Nancy Holtquist, are you still there? Can you type what that, uh, th there's a woman named Nancy Holtquist who lives in our valley and she has been emailing out links for people to read ahead of time uh, for these live streams. And Nancy had one link that I went to and I found all that information. Pretty much everything that I put together tonight uh, is from that one link. Nancy, would you mind sharing that? Because I can't find it easily right now. And thank you for, for doing that extra work. Um, you all want to know that where that, I'm sure that's where it's from. I'm sure it's where it's from. Uh, if we don't get anything from Nancy in the next five minutes, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to scramble for it, but I don't think I can do it easily. Okay, I'm getting a lot of statements, not many questions. Here we go. Eric asks, if I were doing research, would I be working on this subject? I might, Eric. I like tangible things. I like precise things. Uh, in other words, there's, when you work with bedrock geology, 
there's tens of millions of years missing regularly. And so you're working on such vast time scales that you can put stories together. You know that I think uh, geology is best told through stories. You can tell stories, but there's, you know, most of it's gone from erosion. And there's just a little fragments of here and there and this bedrock above Wenatchee and that bedrock over by Lake Chelan. And then you try to, you try to use some logic to tie those things together. So the ice core thing is attractive in that sense that that you can go year by year. And there's something about counting years, whether it's in varves or whether it's in ice or whether it's in trees, that's satisfying to me. So that part, that part uh, is enticing to me. I guess I'd want to be outside though. I think most of your work is, is in a lab um, like you saw. Are glaciers growing? Misty asks that. Um, there's a glacier in Mount St. Helens' crater called the Crater Glacier that didn't exist in 1980 because the crater didn't exist in 1980. And there's a glacier that has been thriving, that has been growing in that Mount St. Helens crater. It's flowing in both directions around the growing lava dome. There's even a hot lava dome and there's still ice that's growing. And so many who are, you know, I was surprised by Susan's answer that she, she feels like the tide is turning and a lot of people are, are acknowledging significant climate change. From the folks I talk to, there's still massive amounts of resistance. And the folks who are in firm denial of any of this talk of uh, human caused climate change point to that glacier in Mount St. Helens. Well, that glacier in Mount St. Helens is growing because of local conditions that are extremely favorable. It's in a crater that's in the shade year round. And there's a lot of precipitation in the Cascade. So there's a lot of precipitation. It's cold at that elevation and you're protected by a north, sl a north facing slope that's right above you. Globally, Almost all glaciers are retreating in size. What's the oldest date available in an ice core? When did the ice sheets form? The device nine. Um, I specifically Googled that. I wanted to know, first of all, when did they start drilling in the Antarctica ice? And the, the answer I got was there's a Vostok core that started by Russians in the 1950s. And uh, there's a place where they've gotten down in Antarctica to ice that's 800,000 years old. So that, as I understand it, there's not one hole that goes from today down to 800,000 years. But like many things in geology, you've got a co core here, a core here, a core here. You correlate time-wise and collectively you get 800,000 year record between Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and uh, when did that ice form? Well, now I'm not an expert and I can just kind of try to think on my feet. When the earth goes into full interglacial mode, and there are dozens of those in the last 2.6 million years, does that mean the ice completely goes away? Do we completely melt all the ice on Greenland and all the ice on Antarctica each time we have a full interglacial? I guess not if we have a continuous 800,000 year record of ice. I'm thinking on my feet now, you're, you're talking to me live. I've never really thought about that. I didn't show you a clip. I think I was going to, and I maybe just lost the clip. Uh, there was a guy that's just talked about the volume of ice that we currently have on Greenland. And I think of the ice sheet on Greenland is barely there. But he says, if you, if you take the time to look at the acreage of ice sheet that's on Greenland today, muffler boy, and if you melt all that ice, you, you're gonna add 20 feet of sea level around the world. Sea level will rise 20 feet just by simply melting all the ice on Greenland. That's a lot of ice and that's a lot of water to raise the level of the bathtub 20 feet. That caught my ear. Are we doomed is the question. See, to me, that's where many people go with this. It becomes emotional both uh, the sky is falling and also those 
smart asses are telling me what I'm supposed to do and I'm not, you know, that, that's, that's not what I do with my own bit. I don't want to, I want to want to go there. I want to look at evidence. I want to be as objective as possible. And I feel like even those, so now here's soapbox moment. Even those that have devoted a career to communicating ice and climate change and all the stuff we're talking about tonight. I haven't seen them all present number one, but the tone is a little bit wrong in many of the presentations. This is just me talking now, but if I have a specialty, it's communicating with a large group of people who have different backgrounds and different ideas. And I, I practice to be as impartial as possible. I hope you don't know anything about my politics or many things, even though you've been in my backyard for, for two months. I hope I'm, I'm uh, vanilla enough and I hope that the trust is there enough that you're willing to at least listen to and, and what I'm trying to, to say or what I've tried to learn myself. And I feel like there's many ingredients that go into that. And so I don't think it's an accident. There's still major pushback because I don't know if the tone is appropriate or correct or right on the mark with a lot of people. And I, I want to talk about a lot of different kinds of geology. I, wouldn't, I don't want to just specialize in this. And I try to be a positive person, so I don't, I don't want to generally go that way. Okay, how about two or three more? I'm, I'm obviously out of my element here tonight, and that's why we had Susan uh, with us. What was that, Robbie? How can they tell how much seasonal melting contributed to the huge floods? I don't know if you're talking about, Robbie, if you're talking about the Missoula floods, I don't think anybody's talking about seasonal melting. I don't know how you'd have that amount of precision. If you're talking about huge floods in Iceland underneath an ice sheet or the huge bodies of water that are, have been now found underneath the Antarctic ice sheet or in Greenland, I guess. Uh, again, I doubt we have the precision to talk about seasonal melting, but what do I know? Okay. I'm skipping some of your questions because I don't have a good answer. For, I'll leave with, I'll, I'll end with Frank's. Frank says, uh, you've commented that glaciers unusual in earth history. So have we just had the good fortune to live in a time of glaciers? I would view it that way, Frank. Let's finish like that. I've got a screenshot, I think I can find it, from that uh, Volcanoes... Actually, let's just do a quick little review. So, so this is from the Milankovitch talk, and we have our glacials and interglacial signatures down here. And here's just simply taking the math that's been done by, not flipping you off, by Milankovitch. Uh, to contribute. So just his work, before we even got into the core business, uh, was, was documenting uh, this pattern. And then to me, that's the biggest takeaway of this, the, these whole series of things, that you've got a guy separated in time by decades coming up with the same calculations that we are now observing if we go layer by layer in the ice and layer by layer in the deep sea. But we're finishing with Frank's comment slash question and we'll, we'll get my face out of there. But, but this was uh, my attempt to look at our crazy fluctuations in global climate in the last 2.6 million years. And this swinging, this global climate pendulum swinging back and forth is Milankovitch, plus perhaps some minor modifications by volcanic events, perhaps by modified by take your pick, your favorite part of this. Uh, but it feels like, uh, Milankovitch seems to be the main cycle going on here. You can take uh, issue with that. But Frank is remembering one of the main points that is not a controversial statement. If we're looking back millions of years, tens of millions of years, hundreds of frickin' millions of years, we only have evidence of a couple other ice ages. 
and we have between, I'm reading backwards now, 250 million years ago until less than three with no ice on this planet. No ice. And we are far warmer here than we are today. We are far warmer here than we are here. I'm, I'm yelling now just to emphasize Frank's point. That we are living in an unusual time, an unusually cold time, if you are truly looking at hundreds of millions of years. However, humans have shown up very, at the very tip of my fingernail there. And based on that plot that we were looking at, it certainly looks like we have made modifications. So that at least this pendulum, it looks like this pendulum has been altered. And what does the future hold? I don't know, but I don't see how you can remove us from the equation and just say it's a natural cycle that's been going on for a long time. This is, this is, the rocks tell us that this is not a pendulum that's been going on regularly since the earth was be, that the earth was made. Okay, that's about as close as I get to a bold stance. I don't know if I'm proud of myself or not. Before we do a toast to you, I remind you that we're do talking about Frenchman Cooley tomorrow, 6 p.m. We're talking about Saddle Mountains, 6 p.m. Thursday night. That's also in central Washington. We've been there before, but we'll bring in some new concepts. Saturday morning and Sunday morning, Pacific time, 9 o'clock, we'll talk about a very important and long forgotten geologist by the name of George Otis Smith. And then Sunday, we'll do some work with Baja BC, Celestia, clockwise rotation. We'll basically try to organize some of the tectonics that we've talked about time-wise. A toast to you. The wind is bouncing the ladder around. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of all of us in every country, in every continent, whether covered by an ice sheet or not. And here's to Susan and her lovely family for joining us this evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. So glad you could make it. Hope that you come again sometime. And we'll see you tomorrow night from Frenchman Cooley. I love you. Goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington. Is he there yet? The gorilla man? I don't want to walk over by the sidewalk. I don't want to meet a gorilla man. I'm afraid of the gorilla man. I don't want to.